Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and I have a marvelous guest with me today, um, Gary Hirschberg from Stonyfield Organic Yogurt. Gary is an old friend. We got to work together, oh, some decades ago when Stonyfield was in its uh, earliest years. And um, I ran into Gary at an event recently in Boulder, and I just said, would you come on the show? And he said, absolutely. So Gary's the chief organic optimist at Stonyfield. Um, he, he founded the firm in 1983. He's got a ton of firsts he's going to talk about today. Gary, I'd just like to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Carol. And just to be clear, I was co-founder with Samuel Kamen. Oh, with Sam, Samuel. of course. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And Sam retired some years ago, didn't he? He did. He did. He, uh, he Right before our sale to Danan in 2001. Yeah, and the two of you were a dynamic duo then, and uh, and you've contributed so much to the organic industry. Tell us a little bit about your background before Stonyfield, and why did you get this love of organic and dairy? Well, it's uh, whenever I'm asked this question, I'm not sure how far to go back, but but uh, let me give it a shot. I, I, I meaning I grew up in New Hampshire and. You know, in my childhood, as as in yours, uh, we watched, of course, the absolute decline of family farmers uh, and really agriculture in general in our region. But by the time uh, when I was a kid, there were thousands of working dairy farms uh, in New Hampshire. We used to get our chickens and our turkey and our eggs all literally right down the street from us or road from us. And uh, by the time uh, I was emerging from adolescence, uh, we were down to uh, you know, just uh, uh, you know, the, the hundreds of dairy farmers left in the state. And by the time Samuel had the inspiration to start Stonyfield uh, out of his rural education center, and I was one of his trustees, uh, we were down, uh, you know, well below that. Uh, when I went off to college, I thought really business and commerce were the source of all of those problems, all the pollution, uh, the demise of farms, the demise of, of rural uh, land and, and just all the kind of environmental threats. Re- and remember, this is the 70s we're talking about. So this was all the kind of questioning authority period. And and um, so I thought I would go, run as far away from business as I possibly could. And I, I actually got into science studying climate change. And and after college, I went to work at and eventually became uh, executive director of an ecological research institute on Cape Cod called the New Alchemy Institute where we learned and we, we advanced uh, different ideas of how to grow food and fuel and treat waste with no use of pollutants, no, with uh, completely solar and renewable powered uh, systems for, for food and energy. And, um, you know, I learned that it could all be done, uh, scientifically at least. I, what, 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 as time went on, and I was, of course, the executive director, therefore responsible for raising money, I recognized mm-hmm. that we didn't exactly have a business model we had a we had a scientific <laughs> model right. and uh, coincidentally uh, ronald reagan became president during my tenure and as i mentioned before i was a trustee of samuel's organic farming school where we, we used to i used to go up to his little um nonprofit and sit at board meetings where he, he would feed us this extraordinary yogurt from his mm. uh, one cow the lily bell <laughs> One cow operation. Yeah, okay. well, it was you know part of it was his school. He was demonstrating all kinds of ways of growing food ecologically. And when Reagan came in, both of our organizations, my institute and his 
center both became very um, uh, in trouble in terms of in terms of revenue because federal funding for organic agriculture or education all tie uh, all dried up. To make a long story short, um, we uh, had to start to come up with means of self support. So at New Alchemy, that was publishing and consulting and and uh, selling uh, kits for f- f- home food growing and fish farming and so on. And at uh, the Rural Education Center, we turned one day at a board meeting and said, why don't we sell this stuff? It was just like a- ambrosia, this absolutely amazing yogurt. So we, uh, Samuel went out and found a $35,000, um, got a $35,000 loan from, among others, a group of Catholic nuns who, who were uh, <laughs> trying to Thank sell. Thank you, the Catholic nuns. Yes, right. The two Jewish guys with the Catholic nuns. And they. <laughs> and they they were okay. selling uh, their monastery uh, Mount Saint Mary's, um, and uh, were wanted to recycle those funds into local community uh, development, and and saw this uh, crazy little enterprise, which was which re- which really set out to be a model for how family farmers can survive. In other words, to add value on the farm, and also a model for consumers to become more conscious of. I mean, things that we take for granted nowadays weren't being used in those days. We, you know, we were talking about local. We were talking about organic. We were talking about hormone-free, antibiotic-free. Um, but, uh, but in those days, people just were just mystified by us. But nonetheless, we were able to persuade the nuns and a couple of other investors to write a, write a check. So we, um, I, uh, eventually wound up my duties down at, uh, uh, on, at, on Cape Cod at New Alchemy and joined. Set, so, so the first cups of yogurt, uh, we got off the line in April of 83. I joined Samuel just a couple of months later, full time. And, and we've been doing this dance ever since. That's an, that's an amazing journey to, to get there. And it's interesting when we get into um, some of the details later that you've got a 360 degree full circle of, you know, taking organic and educating, and we'll get into some of those programs. That's why we call this Purpose 360. I'd just like to commend you that when we talk to um, organizations about embedding their purpose into the center of their culture and their operations, and it's not about marketing, it's about engagement with their consumers and their supply chain, they always say, their North Star, it's it's Patagonia or Unilever. But um, now that I've had a chance to dive back into Stonyfield, besides just eating Stonyfield, you are just right at that same level. So congratulations to you. We're going to get into your positioning in a moment, but I'd like to just go back a step. What is your personal or professional purpose, Gary? Well, first, thanks for that comment. Yvonne is a, an old friend, and and you know I'm I'm a lifelong admirer of all that they've done at Patagonia, and I, I would add Cliff Bar and 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 a number of others to to that oh, list. Oh, there are others, um, sure. You know, in our case, uh, the purpose of Stonyfield has really been my life purpose. It was before, and it's been ever since. And and as you say, and as we'll get into, the purpose was really the thing that not only got us to success, but it allowed us to thrive, really. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, look, I would just say very simply, um, you know, uh, we as humans have had a very uh, flawed relationship to our planet. We think of the earth as our subsidiary, to, uh, there for the taking, there for the using, and there for the dumping. And actually, it's all wrong. Humanity is a, is a subsidiary of our, a bountiful planet. And so my purpose has been to sort of correct that relationship, um, to get back to a place where we understand, uh, that, uh, you know, we've been, we are, we have this, uh, amazing bounty if we take care of it. And, and that ethic is at the heart of Stonyfield. Our, our mission from the get go was to prove that, um, uh, completely organic and ecological, uh, agriculture is not only, um, not only uh, workable, but it's actually financially more viable than than conventional, and that consumers need not uh, have to sacrifice anything in terms of health and the environment when uh, they're making their purchase choices, whether about food or or anything else. So that the central mission has been uh, to close the gap between how we consume and a kind of a, a a more sort of a better consciousness about the planet. You've had that commitment, you know 
way before anybody was truly into social activism. I mean, that's the shiny red object today. You know, companies need to see what can, what bandwagon can I get on and what TV spots can I do? And what's great about Stonyfield, it's not about the bragging. It's about the doing from the product to the farmer's. Um, to the key issues that you take on. So you talk about um, on your website and also in your marketing materials about supporting healthy food, healthy people, and a healthy planet. And that you say that that is the center of, if you do that, a healthy business. Um, how did you embrace this idea of health as a North Star for the organization? Well, uh you know, as I mentioned, growing up, I was watching the declining health of our environment, and but it was unmistakable that people's health was getting challenged as well, seeing, a, a, you know, an explosion in, in cancers and asthmas and other respiratory disease. And, you know, I've, I've long recognized that, uh, you know, the cheapest and most effective form of health care is preventative care, is not getting sick in the first place. Uh, yes, this is a virtuous circle, healthy food, healthy people, healthy planet. I mean, Food is one of the primary uh, means of uh, us getting sick. It also can be one of the primary means, as we now know, of getting, of being healthy. Or, you know, I mean, Stonyfield today supports several thousand organic family farmers who make money at a, with much smaller herd sizes and much less acreage than, than, than their conventional counterparts who are struggling. So we've proven the economics. We've proven the viability. Organic farms uh, give up almost nothing in yields. I say almost nothing because at times of drought, uh, actually organic farms perform better because all that carbon they've put in the soil absorb moisture. So, so the point is, uh, we've had the me we've had the science. Uh, and I, you know, I told you I got into climate change early. Well, organics is a, is a path to avoiding or reversing climate change because again what i just said a second ago it's all about sequestering carbon and we and we now know that it's not going to be enough to just drive you know high mileage cars we have to actually take the carbon and other uh, carbon war global warming gases we've put into the atmosphere and put it back in our soil well that's what organic does that's the heart of it so so um when consumers eat uh, better food uh we become less sick when we buy organic you not only uh support strong uh proven environmental practices but you improve biodiversity you reduce water usage you improve soil carbon sequestration but you're also getting a whole range of of macro and micronutrients that aren't available uh through conventional farming methods you know a purchase is a vote and so you know to your question from the very get go we understood Samuel and I both understood the science. We'd seen it working on our own farms and in our own research. Uh, we knew that a handful of consumers understood this. And we just saw ourselves as educators, uh, really just using business as our means of, uh, as, our, as our chalkboard, if you will, uh, to help consumers connect the dots. <laughs> And certainly purpose-driven companies at the center, that they lead with the issue and that they innovate around the issue. It's not about pounding the chest. And I think that that's what um, always uh, was so uh, delightful about you and Samuel, which is that you innovated constantly. Can you talk about, it wasn't easy in the early days about organic. Nobody knew what we were talking about back in the early days. Okay, I mean, now my, my son is a next-gen organic entrepreneur. He's launched a wonderful line of organic apple cider vinegars. Called, it's called Ethan's. And, you know, I often uh, smile. And fortunately, he grew up at Stonyfield. I mean, he's literally born on the farm. So he, 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 he knows this, that, that <laughs> you know, it's much easier now. Of course, it's more competitive now. There's more players. But, but at least you don't have to educate the consumer about these basic values that you're talking about. But in our day, you know, uh, I always say we had a wonderful company, just no supply and no demand. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, true. really, I couldn't get farmers to use these methods. We, we couldn't get them. We, we eventually obviously did, and we persuaded them sort of one at a time. Uh, Samuel was a serious uh, organic dairy expert, and, 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 and uh, he, he understood the microbiology of soils as, as, as well as anybody. Uh, but getting farmers to change those methods was tough. But we also needed to get, you know, consumers to start to recognize that there's a reason that this 
quart of yogurt costs a dollar sixty nine instead of the dollar twenty nine uh, you know store store brands. So um, it it not only was not easy, it was you know a death. It was it, 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 I mean it was death defying. We uh, if you li- if you listen to the How I Built This podcast uh, on NPR, uh, you know you'll you'll get the full story here. But I mean it was nine years before we even made money, and so this was. The irony of my life was that I I left the nonprofit world to start a business to prove uh, that it's you know uh, to, to to just a to stop fundraising for myself and b you know to prove that uh, you could we could be economically viable. But I, I kept fundraising. This now it was investment for another nine years until we we could finally prove it. But 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 once we you know by the time 1992 came around we were at around 10 million in annual sales. Uh, that's obviously when things took off. And after that, we, we enjoyed a, well, even then we were growing, but we were just having a hard time making money. But we, uh, you know, over the 30 years, the, we, we had a 19.6% compound and annual growth rate, which is certainly the envy of any large company. And, and of course, that's why many large companies are now in the space because they realize that organic, uh, and non GMO, uh, really is a, a better way on the, a better way to, Grow and produce, but it's also uh, that's where the the demand and the growth is from from a, a now educated consumer. You have a really long view, and I really appreciate the long view that you have, both for the planet and the company's role, and even the the partnership between consumers and the company. And, and that's the part I want to ask you about. It it, it definitely seems like you've gotten a a, a core audience of of aware consumers that want to make healthier choices, want to make better choices for the planet, et cetera. Um, is, is that, first of all, how do you maintain that audience? And, and second, do you, do you need to grow that audience? What, what, are your, what are your plans for taking that vision and, and making it even larger and embracing more people? You know, the, 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 the fundamental challenge, and I'll just sort of make this business point here, which I think which you two will really understand. The fundamental challenge of a I'll call it, you know, broadly values driven business, but, uh, but I'll also say more specifically an organic business is that, uh, you know, you, you focus more on the supply end, right? To do things right, to inculcate those values into your product and your process. And that means you bring cost to the table. Um, you know, in our case, we believe that family farmers should not be an endangered species. They should be paid properly. So what that means is right now, my, Milk uh, costs 100 percent more than what uh, you know a, a Chobani or a Dannon or you know non-organic players would be paying. So, uh, and and by the way, the price that they're paying to farmers are not sustainable for farmers. I mean, they're we we we're watching them drop off at, at, at sort of catastrophic rates. We lost 13 percent of New England's farmers last year. So so we start with the premise that you know. We, it's our responsibility as a bridge between the farmer and the consumer to keep them um, viable. And then, of course, you know, we we have we're putting labor into building soils. That's more cost. So the net of all of this is that our gross margin, that is that what's left after your, you know, you take your revenues and then after your cost of your inputs, your goods, our gross margin is is at a huge deficit to our competitors and meaning like 10 points or a thousand basis points. And, and what happened, what that means is that we're, we can't afford advertising. I mean, I mean, in order, in order to make a bottom line and satisfy our investors, and I know we'll get back to that, uh, you've got to, um, come up with more clever ways of reaching the consumer and the good news. And Carol, you know, you're the master, uh, you've understood this for decades. The good news is that if you can, explain your story to and and really help the consumer you know to, you know be fully transparent and show your value system that has a way of attracting and bringing consumers to you and so sort of the history of consumer products is about making stuff as cheap as you possibly can and then using that big margin to spend as much money as possible on advertising but the history of the organic revolution is the exact opposite it's about doing it right and then hoping and that you can uh, help consumers to understand what's happened today. That that's the story of Stonyfield is that we weren't necessarily the fastest growing in terms of new consumers because, of course, you know, buy an ad in the Super Bowl that really works. 
but we were the fastest growing in terms of building loyalty. And and the and the and the va- and the benefit of loyalty, as Carol has preached forever, is word of mouth, right? You know, you're you're much more likely to buy a product from a somebody who says uh, to you know you really should try this or use this than 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 a, than a commercial or an advertisement. So um, the challenge today, though, just to sort of round this out, is that uh, as I said, uh, our time has arrived. You know, the millennial consumer doesn't need to be explained about climate change. They, they, they've grown up knowing and understanding this, and now they've got purchasing power. They don't need to know about a rising cancer, be told about rising cancer rates. It, it's happening all around them. Everybody knows somebody dealing with cancers. They don't need to know, be reminded about brain development and the relationship to food or autism or ADHD or any of the other uh, problems that are resulting from our poor eating habits. Uh, but so what's happened is now we've got more competition. And so the challenge today is how you tell your story when there's 10 other organic players out there uh, telling a similar story. So let's go back to some of your innovations first, because I don't think that our listeners know how many firsts you had, which allowed you again to tell your story in a different way. So can you talk a little bit about packaging and Yo Baby, a little bit about that and why that was so important to creating that loyalty with your consumer? Sure. Well, from the very beginning, of course, to my my answer to Chris, we we couldn't afford advertising, so we had to use our packaging. So we to explain our story. So our lids, the yogurt tops, were always uh, embracing causes uh, uh, back in the day: anti nuclear and 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 uh, anti synthetic growth hormone and 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 pro uh, climate change and solar and renewable initiatives. And you know, people hadn't seen that before but you know you pick up a pack and there's a little political message on it and uh, you know it got us into trouble once in a while when i had my annual rant on campaign finance reform we had a lid that said uh in politics the cream doesn't always rise to the top as our yogurts did you know it was my rant that you shouldn't have to be a millionaire to to run for office and <laughs> and unfortunately our, our 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 yogurts had shown up on capitol hill uh in the cafeteria just when that lid broke and we got our yogurts returned with a note that said, "Dear Gary, uh, it's too political for Capitol Hill," which I always love that. I got that. Um, but that's a but, funny line right there. That's great. Right, but it but it was um, right. that 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 rivals the line when I wrote an op ed to the Wall Street Journal, and the, we we were proving all along uh, that climate change was actually an opportunity for more profits by by being uh, more ecological and more less wasteful and to switch over to more renewable forms of energy, uh, we were actually saving money. And so I wrote this in an op-ed of the Wall Street Journal and the head of the editorial page wrote back, Dear Gary, I love your yogurt. I eat it every day. I just can't stomach your views on climate change. That's <laughs> funny. Yes. Yeah, no, we have a lot That's of so these. Funny. But anyways, to come back to the point, we so we used our packaging to promote our mission, which again, you understand why now. I mean, it got, it, it, this is the only way we could explain. We wanted people to pick up the cup and look at not just the you know, the potassium and the fat level, but also the, you know, to see who we were. Um, as Carol, as you said, we uh, we had uh, this wonderful cream on top, whole milk yogurt, which we discovered everybody was using to feed their babies because babies need whole milk for brain development. And, you know, pediatricians uh, were recommending uh, this product. But, but what they didn't like was they didn't like the large, uh, they didn't like to feed their baby out of a large container and then close it again. So we innovated and came up with this idea of Yo Baby, which was our whole milk cream on top in small uh, packs made, by the way, from polylactic acid, which is PLA, which is a plant-based polymer. So so actually, literally, our six packs of yogurt are not made from plastic, or I should say 90, 92%. It's, 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 it's made from, from plant materials. Uh, so we innovated that. We innovated, as you said, uh, organic in tubes. Uh, we innovated organic smoothies. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, not all the innovations worked. We innovated, uh, garden salad yogurt back in 1986, uh, and spicy garden salad. And the very same day that one buyer from Demoulis said, uh, one buyer from Purity Supreme, who was Armenian, so he was used to savory yogurt. He said, you guys are geniuses. He said, this is incredible. The very same day that the, the buyer at uh, Jack Demoulis over at Market Basket said, this stuff is the most disgusting thing I've ever had in my life. If you, I would, the, the problem was when the cream rose to the top, so did the herb. So it looked like a putting green when you open it. Um, and he said, I'll, you know, I'll never let you in my store again. So, uh, you know, 
the, I guess the story of entrepreneurship is, is always about, you know, taking risk or not even seeing risk, just trying new ideas. But, but I think, uh, getting back to your point, Carol, and your question, Chris, I mean, this innovation wasn't just because we were clever or because we were, um, you know, uh, inventive, which we, we were, I, I'd say, and are. We're doing some amazing innovation right now. Uh, but it was because, again, that's the necessity. It's how to reach a new consumer. I mean, in our day when we started, you know, there were two kinds of yogurt, big cups and little cups, right? I mean, today there's Greek, there's spoonable, there's drinkable, there's plant-based, there's squeezable, there's, there's yogurt in pouches. Um, we're innovating now a, a completely vegetarian uh, product in, in, um, in a fruit and veg product in pouches. Because uh, nowadays in the age of convenience, you know, people want, it's all about one-handed eating and pa parents like squeezing because, you know, the kids don't spill it all over themselves like they do with a cup and a spoon. And, and, and you must innovate to, to, to stay ahead. I, in our case, though, we, we burdened ourselves with an added criteria, which is that, um, in my sister was our uh, v vice president of natural resources. And in the, uh, early, uh, Late eight, no, I guess it was the early nineties. We, she commissioned, we commissioned a study at the University of Michigan to look at packaging because, of course, you know, most consumers, uh, when they think about doing something environmental, they think about recycling. Uh, but actually recycling is not the greenest thing you can do. In fact, it's often not even green. There's a huge amount of energy that goes into capturing, collecting, you know, regrinding and, and reusing those materials. And so, what the University of Michigan study showed us, and therefore this became kind of a credo at Stonyfield, is uh, essentially less is more. That that mass is, energy is embodied. Uh, ma mass is embodied energy, and so uh, the 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 while re while producing in recycled materials is, of course, virtuous. Uh, if you had an efficient recapture and recycling system, uh, actually the more profound thing you can do is just use less. There's Far, in other words, plastic or material that will never have to be recaptured again. So we were, we burdened ourselves because again, we were scientists. We came at this, um, knowing more than even I think, you know, the consumer understood. And so every innovation was always about reducing packaging weight and size. Uh, that's why we took those plastic overcaps off way back. We were the first, uh, to do that back, back in the day. And, 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 you know, this continues. As I say, the pouches are not recyclable. Uh, we're working on a more bio, de, biological solution, but they are the lightest weight. Uh, and so you, you know, this, 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 this is always the challenge because the consumer, sometimes you're doing things that the consumer, you know, doesn't get yet. And, and where do you get your ideas? I mean, are you, I mean, obviously you have amazing instincts, um, but also are you in con conversations with consumers? You do focus groups, you go out into the market, because these are a lot of breakthrough ideas. Well, back in the day, uh, I mean, we, you know, we didn't have enough consumers to talk to. I mean, of course we got consumer feedback. You know, one of the, one of the other, some of the other innovations were in communications, right? I mean, we, at the beginning, remember, we were educators. He, Samuel ran a farming school. I ran an ecological research institute. So, you know, what do you do when you're an educator? You create a newsletter. Well, you know, remember, this was pre-internet. So back in the day, we had something called uh, moos from the farm, all the moos that spit to print. And this was our, and we sent, sent this out, and we had, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of consumers. Remember, we use mail, like snail mail. Like I know <laughs> I remember. I remember. Don't know what Adopt I'm a even cow. Talking. Well, I, so like, I was about to say, so yes. one, so one day, uh, uh, one of our buyers uh, said, what are you going to do for advertising? You know, and we said, well, we have this wonderful newsletter. He said, not enough, you know. So we were driving back to the farm thinking about how to answer him and to, and we had to go milk our cows and it suddenly dawned on us, uh, let's do adopt a cow, which we later changed to have a cow. Um, and, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, did this. What, what you did was you sent in five yogurt cups. And we, of course, advertise this right on our cup and also on shelf talkers on the, on the shelf. You could send in five yogurt lids. You would get a certificate naming you the co-owner of a cow. And then your cow would, in those days, send you two letters a year. Huh. Uh, nowadays, of course, they tweet <laughs> and they blog and they, you know, the cows are, it's all electronic. It's all, so, you know, social media, no paper, much more green. But, but so, you know, we had to come up with these kind of new ways of 
talking to people. But to, to answer you specifically, I mean, I, I think a lot of where our innovation came from and comes from is in, in the culture that we created. I mean, th- th- this has long since been a company that Samuel or Gary, you know, are the lead creatives and we have, you know, 400 plus people there and, and the ideas come from everywhere. And I, I want to tell you about a really exciting one that we're working on right now. Um, which really emerged from a, a group of us working together. Um, and, and a lot of times, you, Carol, you're absolutely right. It does come from conversations with consumers. We have a very high touch company. So we were, um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we have th- these thousands of family farmers who have been very aware of, of our and measuring very religiously the reductions in pesticides, uh, or pesticides and herbicides we've been able to avoid. But but we are also aware, and I'm I've been a soccer coach. I was a soccer coach for 20 years, and uh, all three of my kids. And and we're also aware that there's another way that our children and our and 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 uh, all of us get exposed to pesticides and herbicides, and that's on our far, on our parks and our fields. And it turns out that 66 percent of America's parks and playing fields are treated to one of three. Uh, uh, very toxic herbicides. Uh, in one case, it's, it's, it's a known carcinogen. In the other two, it's a likely carcinogen. We're talking about 2,4-D, which is half of Agent Orange, okay? Hmm. Uh, di- dicamba and glyphosate. 66% of our playing fields are exposed. And if you stop and think about it for a second, our skin is actually the largest organ on our body. And so when you dive for a Frisbee or your dog goes out and rolls around in the grass or you as a little kid roll on the grass, that stuff's coming, going directly into your bloodstream and we put through, through contact with your skin. That means that if you come out uh, in off of a playing field with your soccer ball, uh, uh, your child and, uh, or basketball or whatever, and you don't wash your hands and you eat your food with your hand, your sandwich, you know, you're eating, you're, you're consuming glyphosate. And, and we now know this to be a fact. This isn't, you know, this isn't like crazy hippie stuff. This is clinically proven. So, we launched a program uh, last year called Stony Fields, uh, which is uh, for our 35th birthday. We've adopted 35 cities, or at the moment we've now we're now up to 20. We have another 15 to go across America. We're in partnership with the towns and with grassroots groups, and this gets back to the point with consumers in these towns who want to uh, work on these kinds of things. We have um, uh, uh, helped them. We're helping them to convert their playing fields and their parks to organic. And what's exciting is, um, you know, for example, we've partnered with Walmart in Salt Lake City and in Houston, Texas. Uh, uh, th- when we do these fields days, thousands and thousands of people come out. Um, the, the, by the way, the conversion to organic in, in within three years, it save, starts saving the communities money. And the, and the parks and rec folks um, in these communities have uh, told us the grass is actually greener. Uh, when it's been treated organic. So Adam Scott of Parks and Rec, that television program, has actually become our spokesperson for this thing. And he's out. Adam's also a father and a soccer coach, so he's out talking about it. So we're we're having a lot of fun. So the, the innovation continues is, I guess, my point. And I, I, we will, in our show notes, we'll put a link to the new rules of soccer with Adam, which is really funny. And, and the kids in that are going like, I can't believe he's going to do this to us. It's great. It's really, it's, it's, I, I all, besides your big passion, Gary, is that you're also an intrinsic marketer um, that you, but you market to matter. Which is which is really important. Well, you know, I appreciate that, uh, uh, but I, I, you know, it, it reminds me to say also to Chris's earlier question. You know, um, when we sampled consumers, so now you've got a growing organic marketplace, right? Particularly of millennial parents, right, who just are not going to compromise on what they're feeding their kids. And uh, we sampled them and asked them about this field project, and seventy six percent said that they buy organic to avoid pesticides, but the same number in polling said they'd never thought about the fields where their kids play. So so what we're doing Hmm. here is we're kind of dimensionalizing ourselves. And what's beautiful about fields, honestly, is you don't have to buy a single cup of stony field uh, to to participate. Obviously, it's it's, we're, we're helping these, we're giving these fields money and technical, these towns money and technical assistance. So it's not like we're selling at people, but there's a there's a glow that people get. There's a good feeling that they get 
that there's a company out there, you know, even ahead of them, watching out for them. And that that's that that comes back around to that kind of loyalty build that I talked about earlier. Yeah. An organic loan, not a pesticide. Glow. Well, uh, so, I, <laughs> that, well, that's that stole it's that from you, Chris. <laughs> it's also well. You see, that's funny because I was going to say it's a it's a grassroots movement. Uh, you guys are great. As we have to wind this down, unfortunately, can you talk a little bit about just label it? You know, we're, we're literally the only Western country that doesn't ha- didn't have labeling. So, uh, and and I just felt that consumers, when they were aware that you know there's this sort of pesticide herbicide mill, they would want to know about it. I'm not inherently opposed to GMOs or genetic um, work per se, I, but I don't, but I don't, but I think people ought to know what they're eating and, 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 and what's in it. So we created a nonprofit called Just Label It. We lobbied for years uh, through the Obama administration to get a national labeling standard. We managed to get a bill passed in Congress. Um, and now, and, and, and that bill required that uh, the federal government I- introduce uh, labeling rules so at the same time, just to you know summarize the, the I mean what consumers we we all need to keep advocating for labels, and when we get a more enlightened administration, we'll be back at it to fix these rules. But in the meanwhile, consumers obviously should be looking for the non GMO label or more more fundamentally buy organic because organic organic prohibits GMOs. I want to go back to the Danone case and and when when they say we need to learn more of what you've got. How does that knowledge transfer happen, and how do you how do you get a larger entity to start to buy into some of these deeper um, deeper vision and philosophy issues? Yeah. Well, so about I joked with Carol before we started the call that I can't remember what year things happened anymore. I just try to remember which decade, and and I'll say somewhere roughly a decade ago, I wrote a book called "Stirring It Up: uh, How to Make Money and Save the World," in which I profiled companies not just in the food business but across Lots of sectors who had demonstrated uh, unequivocally that uh, values equals value. That 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 by uh, being more environmentally responsible or more socially responsible, it actually was more. You made more money, and you know Carol's obviously preached this forever. You know, with Danone, you know there were lots of reasons they paid a very high price for our company and left me with this. Uh, but but you're right. The, the CEO knew that, but I had to kind of persuade the next. Yeah, and in fact, ironically, the C- current CEO of Denon at the time was the CFO, and he 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 was not in favor of paying such a high price for Stonyfield, and he had to become uh, convinced over time. So, to your point, the answer, Chris, is by example. I mean, it wasn't my word. Yes, I would speak at their annual shareholder meetings, and I would work in you know in in conference rooms on acquisitions and innovations and so on, but. But really what they saw was they saw a company with 10 point, a 10-point worse gross margin growing far faster than anything in their portfolio and, and making great money. Um, and they saw a, a supply chain that was stable and where they're fighting, you know, where they have declining family farmers and, and where we're paying a proper fr- price. And then they saw all the other metrics. Um, and, you know, they're European and the consciousness about uh, as, as is lactalis, and uh, the consciousness about climate is far advanced to, to what it is here, as it is through most of the world. And and so, it was really the uh, sort of stream of examples, tangible, concrete examples. You know, here, here, here's here's the easiest way I can summarize this. We, I mentioned my sister. Uh, under her leadership, we launched something called the Mission Action Program in the mid '90s at Stonyfield, and this looked at our 360 degree. Uh, footprint on in all aspects: our water usage, our packaging, our shipping, our transportation, our our milk, our cows, which is by the way the biggest climate footprint. And in every case, we created a team, an integrated team of financial people, engineers, technical people, sales, marketing, and we attacked each of those footprints. And what we discovered was every time we would reduce a footprint, for example, converting over from transporting product over long distances from truck to train, or by uh, converting our wastewater uh, treatment on our facility to a biogas digester that produced energy and, and produces heat that we use for our pasteurizing. Every one of those, was we had a very quick return on investment, a, a payback that, w- that was far faster than if we continued our sort of polluting our less conscious ways. And so by measuring all of those things, and, and just, you know, with our farmers, um, by by making sure that 
with organic farming, you know, the, far, the, the cows eat grass, right? They're herbivores, not carnivores, and, the, and they have access to pasture. What happens is they actually literally produce less methane, which is a major global warming gas. And, and also, by the way, organic cows live twice as long as conventional cows. So that makes the farmers more profitable because they're, they're healthier, right? So with, by measuring all of these things religiously, and, 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 and again, we did this because we needed to, you know, whenever you make a claim to a consumer that you're standing for this or that value, you've got to defend it. You've got to, because you're inviting cynicism, you're inviting certainly your competitors, journalists, bloggers, others to challenge you. And so we needed to know. We needed to know what we were talking about. And, and, and so the metrics were critical to our marketing, but it ended up being very persuasive to Danan and cer- certainly to Lactalis. So one of the other things that we do kind of as, our, as we wrap up is ask folks to just kind of share three key insights that they would give to other people as they're starting their journey, you know, at the top of the company or in the middle somewhere to, to bring an organization towards their purpose. So what what are what are the what are the top three things you'd recommend? Well, the first, and now I can say, you know, this was a hypothesis when we set out, but now it's proven, is that uh, when you bring uh, when you inculcate values that are meaningful to your consumer into your business, uh, you will get loyalty as a result. And loyalty is, um, you know, is the holy grail of consumer products, right? You know, getting people to not even look at another yogurt, but just to grab for yours. And, 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 and that comes from not just talking, but doing. Uh, so that's one. Number two is, um, you have to believe in yourself. I mean, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, a lot of this, uh, this stuff is, you know, when we set out, like I said earlier, there was no supply, there was no demand, but my lesson in hindsight is, uh, you know, determination is probably the most undervalued and essential element for success. Um, that has to come from inside. You can't get that from focus groups and from external stimulation. You've got to really believe in, 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 in the values that you're leading with. And I guess the third, uh, is that, um, you know, this is all eminently worth doing. I mean, this, we have a, a planet in peril. We are making ourselves sicker. I, you know, we got into this, as I said earlier, through a whole series of, small efforts and this is small steps and this is how we're going to get out but business is the most powerful force on the planet it has the greatest power to concentrate resources to do good and so um you know i i would just say i guess in summary we're all compost eventually right so 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 you know why (laughs) not why not uh dedicate your business resources to uh doing something that's that's better for the world It, it it will build loyalty it will build um, uh, profits, and uh, you might just do some good while you're at it. And talk a little bit about why is that important today for companies to become B Corps? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, when, when Jay first came up with the idea of B Corp, I, I believe I was the first company he called. This was whenever it was. And I, at the time, said, gee, I, I don't know, Jay. I don't know. I mean, we're doing all of this anyways. And I'm not sure I need, and people know who we are and they know what we're doing. And I don't think we need the extra cost and hassle of another certification. Um, and uh, then, so we passed. <laughs> and uh, along the way to his and his colleagues' credit, uh, he really built this brand. And uh, what he did was he turned to companies who didn't weren't known for their values and help them to uh, create a kind of an identifying mark, but also a, a credible, a sort of a third party validation, you know, a, a set of standards that, that, that the company committed to. And it's really become necessary because there, I think people in the know, I don't know that all, you know, many consumers know B Corp as many as probably will over time. But for those who do, uh, it's really a mark of um, of a commitment and but more importantly of an achievement and so i think uh it's now become very important and and the company you know after i was out uh uh as a, as a day-to-day executive uh the company said to themselves listen you know we we don't have you know gary sort of leading the charge with this stuff every day um, we're one of those companies that needs to remind people that we stand for these things. So that's why it was embraced. And I'm glad, and I'm glad they did. How do you feel being back at the, you know, leadership position 
at Stonyfield now that you're 400 million, million. I've seen you talk about maybe you're going to go to a billion. How do you feel about that? Well, look, I love it. I mean, to be very clear, uh, uh, I have influence without responsibility, which talk about holy grails. That's, that's, that, that's kind of it, right? I mean, I, I get to come in. I mean, the CEO of the company is uh, a fantastic guy who was my marketing VP, by the way. And many of the people are, are, are folks I, I hired. And so, of course, you know, I love, you know, you always love your company, right? I, I, I was heartbroken the way it was being not as well cared for under the prior ownership. But um, but now, uh, you know, we're growing beautifully. There's a lot of... Um, uh, the, the the new owner, as I said, has really sort of doubled down on our values. Um, but it's also uh, incredibly satisfying to see someone else running it. I mean, one of the things that, you know, as a, as a kind of a, and I've heard Yvonne talk about this at, at Patagonia is, you know, you, you, when, when it's just, when, when nothing happens, if, when it only happens when you're running it, then it's suspect, right? You, you know, you, you want to see other people embracing the values because they make sense. And, um, and, you know, the launch of the Stony Fields project and the, some of the really amazing innovations happening in packaging, uh, and new products and, and just the absolute embrace of organics. Uh, it's just unbelievably satisfying to see the next gen running with it. Who do you admire besides we talked about Patagonia, we talked about Cliff Bar. Who do you admire um, as other companies um, do, you know, really bringing purpose into the center of their operations and why? Yeah. Well, those two are top of my list. Uh, I love the folks at uh, Organic Valley who have uh, really embraced the family farmer and they've built uh, George Seaman, the CEO there, is, um, or actually he goes by CEEI. E I E I O. Uh, <laughs> uh, they have, uh, you know, it's a billion dollar co op. I mean, they, they have really shown, and, and this is all while conventional farmers are failing. Um, I, you know, I, uh, Denise Morrison was someone I really admired at Campbell's. I'm sorry she's out. Uh, I worked with Denise on a number of acquisitions and deals. Uh, she was terrific. Uh, I, you know, I, I do see uh, a whole generation of uh, younger. Or earlier stage entrepreneurs coming up who I, who I admire for their, um, you know, their vigor, for their energy. Uh, I mean, th- th- you know, some are, are really tiny. You, you know, Carol, and this is a good chance for me to make my plug. I run this, uh, uh, entrepreneurship institute, uh, every year. It's June 6th and 7th this year in Boulder. It's called the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute. Uh, you can see it at hirschberginstitute.org. But, um, you know, I get 200 entrepreneurs who show up every year for this thing. And we go into, you know, the nitty gritty of marketing and organizational management and so on. So I get to uh, see and frankly admire uh, dozens of these uh, young up and comers uh, and get really, really inspired by them. Oh, that's great. That's terrific. So you have been so gracious with your time and your storytelling and your candor. We really appreciate it. And so, Chris, any last uh, question or comment for Gary? I'm I'm great. This was a really, really great uh, session, Gary. I really appreciate it. And I, I, I super appreciate you explaining how your corporate culture works. So we want to wrap this up. Um, Thank Gary Hirschberg, um, Chief Organic Optimist of Stonyfield Organic Yogurt. And we'd like to leave this question with our listeners. What's What's your your purpose? purpose? (laughs) Thanks. Listen in again soon. Bye, everybody.